Hi everybody, thanks for joining me today. Topic today is drive shafts. We're gonna look a little bit here today at uh, how drive shafts are constructed and the parts of a drive shaft. And I'm gonna pull one of my shop models that we've cut in the middle and shortened so we can see it all in the video here. Now, drive shafts like this are what appears in rear-wheel drive vehicles, all-wheel drive vehicles and four-wheel drives. And you have a different style of drive shaft in front-wheel drives right like right here where we have what they call constant velocity shafts we're going to talk about that a little later on in the lesson but drive shafts so drive shafts sometimes are called propeller shafts because they propel the vehicle down the road for many many years drive shafts have been constructed of, uh, of steel material as far as the shaft construction itself and they're hollow inside so they reduce the weight and they're actually quite large in their size, usually about three to four inch diameters. And by making them larger, we can still make them light and we have that torsional uh, resistance so they don't twist as easy compared to a smaller uh, shaft size. Now, drive shafts, sometimes inside to dampen the ringing sound that they could be, char uh, could be a characteristic of drive shafts when they run sometimes, especially in trucks, they would sometimes insert some cardboard on the inside and they create an accordion style shape within the uh, within the shaft within the drive shaft center itself and that would dampen any kind of sound that you might get out of it. I haven't seen in my later years uh, that to be the case but it was used for many years. Newer drive shafts as well are gone to lighter materials so aluminum is, is quite often the material of choice in today's cars. They have to be a little bit larger because aluminum itself is a little uh, a little weaker as far as tensile strength goes. So by making it bigger, it still is a light drive shaft, lighter than these guys. They get the strength needs that they require of it. And as well, they end up uh, get the lightness that they're desiring. So. At, on the end of the drive shafts, guys, there are what they call yokes right here, and I'll turn it sideways so you get a little better view. And in the yoke assembly itself, they place universal joints. Now, the universal joints are there, of course, to allow the drive shaft to turn and meet different angles between the, the transmission end and the drive shaft itself and the differential end that it goes to where it's driving. If we look at a typical universal joint, how it's constructed, got one taken out. Let me pull it out of the yoke assemblies. And here I have a slip yoke. This one goes into the transmission and it's got splines on the end of it. And this sits in a transmission and the U-joint fits into the yoke itself. Now, the universal joints, sometimes called hook joints or cardan joints, look like this inside. There's a special machine surface called a trunnion. So there's four trunnions on the center cross assembly. These are also sometimes called cross and rollers because they have a cross in the middle and rollers on the end. They are uh, designed to have little tiny needle bearings inside. You can pull the seal off the end to see it. And those little needle bearings ride on the trunnions. Now the center is usually hollow on uh, some universal joints. They put a grease circ in there so they are greasable, which isn't always that easy when they're installed on the car, but you can take them off and grease them in some cases or get a special adapter that'll fit in there and that grease would come through the center of the cross to every roller and fill it up. A lot of manufacturers have gone away from serviceable or greasable joints because people would overpack them, they'd damage the seals, and more grease isn't better if we're damaging the seals. So a lot of times now, you buy a U-joint, you, you pre-pack it, or there's usually pre-packed and you got it in the case. I usually add a little bit, put it back in, and then we assemble it back in the yoke assemblies. Now, there is special instructions on how to do that. I won't do that today with you, but uh, they're often pressed out or some people use a vise and uh, a mallet to tap them out and then they use a vise to put them back in or a special press that puts them back in. So there's your cross and roller universal. Drive. Now, drive shafts will often have uh, they call a slip yoke on the end, which I just mentioned. That slip yoke has splines in it, so it can go into the transmission. Why do we need a slip yoke? Well, slip yokes allow for length changes on the drive shaft. So when the car is going up and down in the back, 
it's going to push the drive shaft forward because it's going through a arc in the back. And as a result, we have to have the drive shaft, uh, the drive train itself has to have the ability to plunge into the transmission. So slip yoke, this has splines in it, can then slip into that seal in the back and onto the output shaft in and out based on where the backward where the back wheels are sitting so it gives me the length change that i need as well it acts as a, a yoke for the universal joint hence the name slip yoke now the back joint itself in this case is bolted onto the differential and this is just a single one piece drive shaft not all drive shafts are one piece some drive shafts are two piece or even three piece drive shafts when you get into bigger vehicles and if they're going to use three piece drive shafts they need to have a bearing in the middle. I've got an example of one. I only got the front half of this drive shaft. You can see the front slip yoke uh, here, but you can see that it's got a special rubber mounted bearing. This is called a center bearing or a steady bearing. And the back drive shaft would take off from there. Now these guys are pretty durable, but sometimes they fail. You know, you get to a certain mileage on the vehicle and the, the bearing life uh, is kind of at its end. The rubber breaks down on them and they can sometimes start vibrating in the vehicle. And if they seize up on there, it can cause a, a real noticeable problem. You get a lot of uh, heavy shuddering under the vehicle, shaking, and, and uh, can sometimes even feel like you got a, uh, you got a real wobble going on your car, but it's all sent from the underneath of your vehicle at the center bearing as this whoops around in there. It really can be quite alarming when it happens. So if you start hearing your drive shaft starting to make noise, you're hearing vehicles under the center of the vehicle, uh, it's time to start looking at the drive shafts, center bearing condition if you have one, and also universal joints. And by the way, when universal joints start to fail, it's not uncommon when you put them in gear to hear a clanking sound when they go in gear forward uh, or into reverse. And sometimes they start squeaking when you take off. They'll make that characteristic squeak, 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 squeak sound coming up from the middle of the vehicle. All right, so that is a typical rear wheel drive, drive shaft or propeller shaft. And it's universal joints and center bearing and slip joint or slip yoke. And by the way, while we're, while we're before we leave that topic, we even use universal joints in steering columns. Here's the, uh, the joint out of a steering column. It has too many, too many universal joints on it. So when we move our steering one way, we can actually send that down at an angle to the, to the steering column and drive it nice and smoothly. A little note about uh, universal joints when they operate. Universal joints ideally run best at about two to four degrees. We don't want them straight because we want a little bit of movement on those joints because otherwise we cut little grooves in the uh, universal joint trunnions here if they locked them on position. So we want to have a little bit of movement going on. Two to four degrees is ideal. Uh, the maximum these guys can run at is about 10 degrees. So once we start getting to 10 degrees, that's getting to the uh, high side of the allowable angle that we can run on them. I know guys like to jack their vehicles up quite high. When they do that, we start robbing quite a bit of power out of those vehicles, trying to turn it to that high angle. And not only that, it can set up a really cyclical vibration between the input side of the drive shaft and the drive shaft itself, and ends up with a vibrational issue. So they're not meant to operate on high angles. I'm just gonna set this aside for now. And you can see under here, guys, the drive shaft on this specific vehicle traveling down this is a four-wheel drive GMC Jimmy and you can see the front slip yoke assembly going into the automatic transmission in this case I want to show you another drive shaft that's also under this vehicle this is a four-wheel drive so you can see a small drive shaft right here a little harder to see but you can see the driving the front differential assembly and where it goes it goes to the transfer case in the middle of the vehicle that's in the transfer case that's just behind the transmission. Transfer case really is, is, is a transmission, it's a type of transmission that allows the propeller shaft to be turned both to the front, differential, and the back. Okay, I wanna show you a little bit about this style of the drive shaft itself, which is a CV shaft, or sometimes called half shafts. They sit on the, in the front of the vehicle and will 
we'll look at that under a vehicle too as well. But this is a typical front wheel drive CV shaft. Now this one has two joints on it. Each car has a shaft on each side and it has two joints on each side. An inboard joint is called, uh, sorry, it's right here's the inboard joint and the outboard joint, which connects to the wheel and turns the wheel. Now the inboard joint of cars has to have the ability to plunge. And you can see this one here, it plunges. So it's called a plunging joint. And when the wheel goes up and down, the drive shaft will also go in and out and depending on the suspension position on it. The drive shaft itself on the CV joint has a splined end on it, which fits into the transaxle, which is a front wheel drive transmission. There's a seal in the transmission to our transaxle to prevent the oil from coming out and the splines go into the side gears of the differential. When the differential turns, it sends power to the half shaft, which then turns the wheel. Now, what can go wrong with these is the uh, seals over time can fail. So whenever we do oil changes or any kind of service on front wheel drives, we wanna make sure we're looking at the condition of the rubber boots on the CV joints themselves. And I like to rotate them around if you can or get a light really closely on them and part the boot itself to make sure there's no cracks or crevices forming in those boots. Once they leak and they lose the grease, it doesn't take long for the dirt to destroy the joint internally. Now, I have a shaft here that's got two styles of joints. Uh, remember, the outside joint is called fixed joint. It doesn't plunge. The inside joint has got a plunging joint. But there's different styles of joints, and I've got a couple here. I'm going to pull that boot off in a moment to show you the inside of that because I don't have that style of joint here uh, to look at that is clean, so we'll have to get a little dirty with you. So there is a joint called a Rosepa joint. Now, this Rosepa joint is called a constant velocity joint because it can run at up to 40 degrees angle without creating a vibration in it. So it runs really smooth. So what goes uh, for velocity here on the input side ends up staying constant on the outside. So there's no vibrational changes between the input side and the output side. So, or speed changes as we go through its arc or turn. And that's why it gets the name Collins Velocity. Now this type of joint that you see here is called a Rosepa joint, a fixed Rosepa to be exact. It has six balls on it, locked into an outer race and an inner race. The shaft is splined into the middle of it and there's a cage holding those balls in place. Now, we can get, uh, now this is an outer joint, it's fixed. You can get inboard Rosepa joints as well. Matter of fact, they're most common today in North American vehicles. They just have a longer outer race and the balls themselves can plunge in there. But other than that, the construction is, is very similar. Now what happens over time on these joints when they wear is they start creating grooves in the raceways and when they get grooves into the balls, as they go down over them, they will start jumping. And when you go around a corner, here's a sure sign that your joint is bad. You go around a short corner, you apply power to it, and you get the characteristic click, 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 click sound as you go around those corners. That tells you, diagnostic cue, that you have a outboard joint likely failing on that. You better check out. Okay, so that is a fixed Rosepa joint. It is the outboard joint. Remember, these are also available in plunging inboard joints. Now here is a inside of what we call a tripod joint and I have a three piece unit in the middle. Uh, it's like a tripod with three rollers on it. So similar to the cross and roller, but with three only that would fit in the middle and the center of it drives the uh, drives that that special tripod in there. Now this one is out of a Chrysler. I believe, no, this actually says Ford inside, so it's out of a Ford. And we're gonna pull the end off of this tripod joint. This is called a tulip, by the way. So if I pull the, the boot back, we've cut the strap on this. You can see internally, and this is messy grease. You can see the internal structure. There's the rollers that fit into the, into the tulip. There's a spring behind the tripod to keep it so there's not a lot of slack in there. And I've got actually a little retainer, so I'm not gonna force that out, because if I force that out, I then have to take the retainer out or bend the retainer to get it properly in, so I'm not gonna take that out. But just to give you a better view of that, I'll turn that. You can see the, I'll turn that so you can see the, the rollers 
on the end of that tripod assembly. And of course there's splines on a shaft that go into the tripod there. All right, so that is your half shaft. Remember, splines on each side, and when they do come out of the center hub assembly, or the, uh, yeah, the center hub assembly on your wheels, it's gonna go through a splined area on that hub that drives the wheel, and there's a big nut in the middle of it, big axle nut that is holding that shaft in place so it doesn't uh, move around in there. And here we're on our front wheel drive vehicle. This is a Chevrolet Cavalier, and you can see the CV shaft going into the right-hand wheel. And we'll get a light over here so we can see the CV shaft. Just get a glimpse of a little bit right there going into the trans axle itself. 